All right. Okay. Uh, all right. So let me uh, introduce you now. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining DataCon LA 2021. Welcome to the data engineering track. My name is Eli, your host, and our co-host today is Lori. We will be moderating the chat and Q&A for you during the session. Today, we have our guest, Sumi Kopar, sorry, and she will be talking about unleashing the serverless data pipeline. Sunita is Senior Manager and Big Data Architect at Edgecast. She has worked on multiple business critical analytics projects on which she has been data architect developer as well as data scientist. Without further ado, I'll hand this over to the speaker. Thank you for being here, Sunita. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Laurie. This has been a great event so far, and I kudos to the team for managing uh, the event so well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me get started with sharing my screen. Give me one second. And yeah, I hope now you're all able to see my screen. So um, what we're going to talk about is um, Unleashing serverless data pipelines, and what we mean by this is um, trying to go with a um, managed serverless architecture that's available through all the cloud providers today. And um, in this talk, we are going to share our lessons learned in the journey. So let me get started. So one thing that we have learned or observed is um, for big data analytics and uh, business intelligence, it's the known fact that domain knowledge is essential. One thing that we need to remember is even for data pipelining, which is also referred to as data engineering, we do need fundamental understanding of the business because a lot of uh, decision making comes once we understand the fundamentals of the business. So let's first understand what is the domain that we are trying to work with here. The, uh, the back end that we are trying to build these pipelines for is essentially for edge cast networks which provides uh, CDN and video streaming, security, and uh, edge computing. And it powers billions of users every day for all their digital experiences. What that means is um, CDN, as it stands, Content Delivery Network, is something that caches content closest to the user. So how you experience it every day is when you watch any OTT content. It could be a game, or it could be a movie, um, or it could be browsing your web pages and it could be accessing your bank account online. So all these are digital experiences that leverage CDN in the background. It may not be obvious to us, but invariably every, every system uses it. So let's understand what is the scale of the um, CDN they're talking about here. Edgecast Networks delivers about six exabytes traffic monthly. And what that means, if you have to visualize it, is uh, imagine 7.5 million users concurrently downloading Fortnite game across the world. That's the throughput that we're talking about. And in terms of video streaming, what that means is about uh, 2.6 billion video streams each month. And when it comes to the security, it kind of provides a security 50 times that of the biggest DDoS attack we have seen so far. So that's the scale, and this is how the offering of the platform looks like. You have streaming, which includes slicing, encoding, uh, delivery, and you have uh, the network layer, which is the delivery um, support. And the uh, top layer is the security aspect, which provides network level and application level security. And then the edge compute. What you mean by edge compute is um, taking machine learning based uh, applications closest to the end user. And what is the uh, spread or what's the span of this? It, it's like we have about 175 points of presence, POPs as we refer to it, globally across six continents. And it provides about uh, 133 terabits per second network capacity. So having said that, that's the domain that we are working with. So you can imagine the expanse of the data or the volume of data that will keep pouring in with every access log or every access request. So what was the business use case that we had to solve um, that was working with this platform? It was essentially trying to understand profitability for every customer at every time period, at every geography. That was the ask. Simple, right? So then what do you have to gather? What should be your uh, raw materials or the input data? First thing you would need is to understand uh, bandwidth cost, the usage cost that you as a business bear yourself. Then the data center cost, which is the infrastructure for uh, all your points of presence. 
And then you have overhead cost of actually running the whole, orchestrating the whole business. So it could be labor, it could be any other associated cost. Then comes the revenue, which is more something you control. And there are different um, mechanisms in which you generally build, right? There is a comet and then there is uh, different discounts or there are various ways of even generating the revenue, which not does not always translate to how you incur the cost. That is where the mapping comes into picture. And to top these, the connecting dot for both of these is the usage, how the customers are actually using the platform. So one thing that we learned early on in our research is that uh, the network providers generally probe the network for every five minute granularity and the, they identify or they uh, measure the bandwidth used. That's something that's kind of um, beyond us. It's more of the vendor setup. So what we then did was we modeled the whole uh, use case end to end and realized that the best thing would be to roll up and roll down the other uh, dimensions of this and bring them to the five minute granularity. This is a very important um, inference and you will see why it matters later on in the slides. And uh, this project and initiative of ours won us a uh, defensive publication. The reference for that is also in the slides attached. You can take a look if you're interested in diving deeper into this business use case. Now let's look at the system overlay, how it looks and how it is in uh, the network parlance. So we have our customers, enterprise customers who push content to us based on the configurations that they set up. And that's kind of propagated across our network, the backbones, and um, it's available to all the geographies. And that's how it's kind of delivered closest to the user, which is why there is uh, best performance. They do not see buffering. They do not see jitter. That's because of the geographic to the closest pop delivering them the data. And all this generates network telemetry. It delivers usage logs, it generates access logs. And all of this needs to be brought back for analysis. To top it, we also have uh, SaaS applications, which are about um, sales orders or service requests, could be invoicing. So all these need to be ingested. And that's what will be our data sources for the model that we work with. For the rest of the slides, we will be focusing on this, which is our problem area or our scope for uh, the next steps here. Before I dive into the actual uh, discussion, I'm expecting some background here. And um, I'll just quickly give you um, a minute for um, this background. We will be uh, referring to Blue ETL, um, AWS Blue ETL, which is essentially AWS provided managed Spark setup. And DynamoDB, you would have heard others similar to DynamoDB, like Cassandra, or HBase. They are the parallels. And this is, again, an AWS managed key store, or NoSQL, as they call it. Then we have Athena, which is um, somewhat similar to Hive and Presto, if you have heard it in uh, on-prem setup. This is essentially the SQL layer on the data sitting in S3. Then we have Impala, which is, um, I'm not sure how many of you hear it off late. Um, this is an in-memory compute or a SQL engine that used to come packaged, it still comes. It comes packaged with uh, Cloudera Hadoop setup. And AWS QuickSight is a managed um, BI service. So you will be able to do visualizations of the like of Tableau, if you say. Um, I would like to pause here for a minute for any questions before I dive deep into the actual options and um, concept. Laurie, Kim, are there any questions we should take? Uh, there are no questions yet, but uh, feel free to put your questions into the Q&A um, uh, now, or uh, we'll get to them at the end. Thank you. So let's continue on uh, what our option was. So the first option that we started with was um, to bring in an ETL uh, tool like Talent. The parallel to this would be something like Informatica ETL. The reason why we started off with this is uh, it was quick to get us running off the ground because it had built-in connectors to all the SaaS that we needed to pull from. And um, it was uh, easier, like uh, visually, you could build your uh, ETLs with this. So that was the first thing we started with. And then we had a Hadoop cluster that used to run the jobs and um, store the data. And then Looker was the BI tool for it. 
this is uh, interesting to discuss now because when Hadoop or uh, the big data ecosystem uh, product started long back, it was a rule of thumb to get data uh, or compute closer to data. That's how big data processing started. It's like, you know, you, the data is very huge. We cannot bring the data into engines. So let's take the compute and distribute it across wherever the data sits. This worked really well initially because at that time, the congestion was on the IO side. But as the big data systems evolved and computations became complex, the bottleneck shifted back to CPU and memory. And then you had to scale both of them independently. You had to scale compute independently for different time times, and you had to store uh, scale uh, storage separately. So this architecture at that time started failing for us. What we had to do then was to figure out other options which can help us scale independently both compute and data and uh, also help us customize the ETLs because uh, the standard drag drop options that you get were not enough. We had to provide or perform more complex mathematical models and um, just doing them with generated code, trying to augment generated code was really difficult. The other challenge that comes in as you mature in your data pipelining or your uh, um, systems is like um, when you want to change the environments, you want to deploy jobs, you want to manage them in bulk. You do not want to manually go click and say deploy to dev, deploy to prod, and manually promote the jobs. That became difficult for us. And the other thing that we uh, initially had started to try out and it kind of uh, became a challenge for us is um, trying to run the streaming jobs. When we started using it with uh, talent, the first thing you would try is with a client setup. You would try to run it with um, job server setup, as they call it. It's essentially the talent client, Hadoop client that runs the job. And that ended up killing the job servers itself because of the sheer volume. So these were the challenges we faced with what we initially used. It served us well, but then we had to move on to figure out something else. So what were the options we explored at this time? First was to experiment with EMR. What is an EMR is um, essentially managed cloud computing. So instead of having a Hadoop layer, you get Hadoop pretty much as a service, as a platform. So uh, we tried with EMR for our Spark jobs, and we kind of broke it apart, right? Whatever was on the Hadoop stack, we broke it into components from whatever is available from AWS. So the um, ingest for the streaming data uh, came through Kinesis. And uh, we moved the agent, like we have, we wrote our um, own agent on uh, the data source side for the usage, basically, because that's your highest volume always. So we wrote an agent with which we could push the data into a streaming, um, like Kinesis Firehose. And then we had the Spark jobs running on EMR to process that and create uh, like um, data sets for further processing for the analytics. Then uh, the other challenge we had was the scheduler. So Airflow is the scheduler that we chose because of the capabilities it provides. It's really robust, and it's uh, completely customizable because you essentially code it. You write the um, orchestration engine. Then the challenge became exactly that, because you needed DevOps experts who could spend time writing the um, uh, scheduler jobs themselves. So if for uh, large teams and um, uh, somewhere where you can have too many people, maybe it works. But generally, for uh, nimble teams, this becomes hard. You have to stretch your resources thin to be able to manage both. That was a challenge. And the other thing was to make these multiple points connect and inter work. Like you had to make sure the orchestrator has the right setup because you are creating it yourself and then linking it to the compute, which is your EMR. That became a challenge. That's when we started exploring third option. We did parallel POCs on both these before we concluded what we wanted to do. And in this setup, what we changed was um, we replaced Airflow and EMR with AWS Glue, the managed Glue service. Uh, the, this was pretty promising. And um, we, did, uh, we were able to move all our uh, processing uh, logic into AWS Glue. Um, and by the way, the more famous version of Glue is just the Athena backend, the catalog part of it. But there is a less known, or at least when we started, it was less known, was the ETL service itself. So uh, that's where we started um, importing or kind of uh, redoing all our compute work. And that's how we tested them. And we were able to provide a comparative analysis. There are challenges, though. 
and the challenges that we came across were um, there is no monitoring at a workflow level. What's a workflow? Workflow is when you have a set of jobs that need to run one after the other. That's like a set of jobs you're stitching together pretty much. Say after this is done, I want the next join. Then after this is done, I want something else. So that orchestration does not um, is not easy to visualize. So the way um, Blue works, you can look at the jobs, you can look at the logs for the jobs. But if you want to go see if the workflow ran successfully, it may say successfully because it triggered the workflow. But it has nothing to do with the jobs. And if they failed underneath, the workflow still says it's successful. That was kind of pretty useless for us to even look at the workflows. And that's one thing that we had to solve for if we had to go ahead with this. And then the other thing was event-driven um, workflow interdependency. Like there are two different data sets, two different processing to be done, but you want them to be interdependent. That was another tough part. And we had to kind of manage it with having buffer and having them triggered on time based. So it has to run at this time. And assuming we have like we give a gap two hours and then the next one will start. That's how we started using it initially. The other major challenge was the development environment was not compatible with production. You would have to create development endpoints, which are essentially, again, EMR clusters. And um, you link your uh, notebooks, SageMaker notebooks, to them. You interactively build your code. And it's not a copy paste to run it into production. You will have to redo some pieces of the code to make it a productionable or productionalizable um, code base. These were the challenges with option three. And if there's any question at this time before jumping to factors, I'll take a look. Ali, I don't think any more questions, right? I don't no, no more questions yet. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So what? Um, why did we come up with this factors? Is like um, essentially through our learnings, what we realized was whatever is the business use case at a high level, we can decide what is the best approach for us based on these factors. So uh, it's more like sh sharing with all of you like what to look for when you're beginning to solution your setup, what should be the factors for you to consider, and what are the pain points or the how do you map your use case to ensure that you're able to make the right choices. That's what the following um, set of slides are about. First thing, any big data system, right, is always volume. That is where our initial option was blocking us. It became a bottleneck. We were not able to scale beyond a certain uh, volume. The other two options that we considered with EMR and uh, with um, Blue ETL, both were very scalable. They were uh, having very equivalent setups. One was managed, one was self-managed. What I mean by self-managed is we have to create the clusters. The, and both options had um, unlimited elasticity. We could grow our compute. We could dynamically scale up, scale down. Both the options work well on this. This was the first factor. The next factor was latency tolerance. And what I mean by latency tolerance is how long can you wait? And it's OK for your business use case for you to wait before you start processing your data. This is completely depending on the question you are trying to answer. For example, if it's a if it's a self-driving car, you have absolutely no time to wait. You have to process the event as it comes. But if it's um, analysis of historical trending or it's like purchasing, how your customers are purchasing, um, again, if it's a recommendation engine, it may will it will have a different set of tools. But if it is um, analysis to identify trends and predict trends, then you are okay with holding on the data for some time. That's one way. The other aspect that you need to bake into this is how much of data am I gathering before I start processing? There may be some relaxation on the business use case front. Maybe you're OK to wait because the business question doesn't need you to make it real time. But the data that's collecting is spanning in terabytes. So you can't keep waiting, or it's going beyond like in petabytes, and you're not able to hold the data for that long. It could be like the limits on the storage. Well, with S3, that's kind of pretty much gone as well. You can store as much data as you want. But it's not advisable to let the data collect for su to such a vo large volumes and then try to process it in one go. That becomes complicated, and that's risky as well. So if you're expecting large data sets, latency tolerable, you don't need the uh, data to be processed immediately, but your data is collecting at, uh, in a very large volume, 
then it's ideal to chunk it in such a way that you create an execution window. And what I mean by execution window is the set of data that you're pulling in in one processing time. Like uh, one job, once it starts, it's going to read so much. It's going to read one hour or it's going to read one day, that kind of segmentation of the input data. So ideally, if you're expecting large volumes and data to keep pouring in, it's good to start with um, uh, EMR based setup because then you can kind of keep shifting and you can have an always on cluster, a smaller cluster rather than trying to spin up a large one at the end of the day. So that's one consideration. So here's where our initial data modeling questions and uh, the research we made came handy. What we were able to do was, since we were trying to align the um, uh, granularities, we were able to roll up the data for some usage elements with which our uh, data source came down to just 10 gigabits per day. And that's when option three became lucrative for us. So what uh, option three was, uh, is again, the blue ETL service, where we were able to use a managed service to pull the data in, process it, and spit out the results. One thing we have to bear in mind is there's a close uh, connection between option two and three. If this processing ends up that you have to always keep running them every third, every 15 seconds or every 15 minutes even, we are beginning to create jobs, then we need to bear in mind that this can go into twice the cost. Um, and, uh, before I jump to the next slide, one point that I uh, missed was on the first option, it was also hard to scale in, in a way that if I need to elastically add more capacity, then uh, on a pre-configured cluster, that's pretty hard. You have to first move the cluster into maintenance mode, add more nodes to it, and then let them readjust, let them readjust the roles, and then start your uh, processing again. So that kind of creates a lot more backlog on your input. And this was the challenge also we had with the first option. So now going a little deeper into the cost, how do we actually understand initially before we you know go all in? How do we estimate the cost that we will hit? Um, with the first option, cost was not a problem actually because that's infrastructure as a service. So whatever you pay, whatever you create a cluster with, you can anticipate what the cost is going to be. The things that we need to remember is the building blocks here. One is the EC2 itself, um, the engine, or, the, or what do you call the nodes, and um, with EBS, which is elastic block storage, that's your disk, basically. And there is a cost to both of them. You just decide how many hours you keep it running, and that becomes your cost. With option two, we need to remember that uh, the pricing looks lucrative. I was initially surprised, like, how come EMR is cheaper than EC2? But what we need to remember is this is an added service. So it is an additional cost on top of uh, EC2. And that's um, that's what it comes up to. And then the third is um, Blue ETL service, which brings in the concept of DPU, which means data processing unit. And data processing unit has a combination of um, com compute, that is uh, your CPUs, vCPUs, and some memory associated with them. Together, it's called a DPU. Again, the development environments are kind of going to be twice. Um, that's another thing we need to bear in mind. We know that AWS is working to eliminate the need of uh, EMR setups for dev endpoints, and they're making it closer to what the production looks like, but it isn't out yet. It's not available to us, at least. Now let's look at how do we actually create the computation. So if we are going with EMR, wherever you see these square boxes, this is kind of a link to the reference in the reference slide, and that's the number that it points to. So um, the cost with the EMR for a comparable job, a single job which kind of reads 300 GB Parquet data. Why is it important to mention Parquet? Because Parquet is a compressed file, uh, file compression technique, and um, Parquet typically has a compression of six times which means in memory, this data set is going to explode six times. So we are taking a comparable range on comparable compute, compute capacity between these two options. So if we take that, then a 300 gigabit parquet data set per execution window, needing 400 nodes on EMR. Again, we are taking M5X large here because the blue um, ETL equivalent worker that we're choosing is of that, um, that setup, that configuration. When we compare these two, you will see that the EC2 and EMR cost per hour, if it's a job that takes two hours, takes two hours here, it's going to cost you about $192. So that's what your job is going to cost you. Now, if the same job 
was run on uh, Glue, Glue Managed DTL, it's going to cost you $350. So that's what I meant that the cost can end up being twice, and you need to bear this in mind. The next thing is uh, data connectors. This is one thing where talent and all the ATL tools of this nature do very well. They provide you an easy and seamless way to pull data from APIs. And uh, it kind of also provides you lineage to show how the data came in. And it automatically tracks some uh, counts to do the data checks, like how many records have been processed, how many are the records at the end of the processing, all that kind of uh, advantages that you get. With option two, we ran into a situation where um, even extending the Sparks data source API was hitting us hard. We were not able to kind of seamlessly consume from uh, REST and SOAP-based APIs. By API, I do not mean Kafka. They work pretty well with Kafka or Kinesis. They don't as much work well with uh, SOAP and the REST kind of APIs. And again, in the references, we have um, some open source code, which shows with a mock setup how um, data source API from, provided by Spark can be extended to read from the APIs, and what were the challenges we faced. For smaller API data sets, it again works, not a problem. It only becomes a challenge when the volume of the data that you're trying to read from APIs is beyond MBs, which is very natural. You end up with that kind of data pretty much very frequently. So both for option two and three, this was a challenge. We had to figure out. Just yeah, to let you know, Sumita, about 10 minutes. OK, OK. So I'll rush through a bit now. Maintenance as, did I miss something? OK, performance analytics. Um, the talent setup came in with Impala, which is an in-memory processing. It was pretty good. Um, we had to figure out something else for option two and three. And um, the maintenance cost, as obvious, if we go with managed uh, infrastructure, there is very less maintenance cost. So what was the decision making left for us the, between these two options is look at the volume. Are you able to uh, afford the latency through latency tolerance? Are you able to model your data in such a way that you can roll up? These were the considerations. And that's how for us in our business use case, three became an option for us. But we had to work with the limitations, right? So um, benefits, yeah, there were a lot of benefits. We were able to reduce the cost of the entire setup by 75% while our volume increased twice. Twice, in fact, it's more than that now. But in our initial processing, when we chose to go with three, it was already twice the volume. And the cost reduced, not just in terms of cloud price, also in terms of administrative cost. So these are like two different elements that we saved on. Those were the benefits. But the limitations was um, it was not actually completely serverless. Like we saw, we had to create our endpoints. We also had challenges accessing the bed UI, which is a very crucial element to diagnose any problems with your uh, data pipelines. We had to create a cloud stack based um, EC2 setup and Spark history servers and the like. And um, ATL service does not give you interdependent workflows, which is another problem. Job startup times were higher. We had to, we could end up waiting for 10 minutes. Again, AWS is waiting for this. What this means is once you submit your job and you say run, it could take up to 10 minutes to keep start the job. And then uh, there was no centralized monitoring. So what we did to kind of solve all these is um, we built our stack around and uh, resolved all the challenges we had, which was like we implemented a custom CI CD based on the Boto 3. So we were able to kind of uh, promote our code ourselves into, uh, into the AWS uh, Blue consoles. And then we created DynamoDB where we used to log our, um, I'm sorry, we created logging into DynamoDB where we were able to uh, augment our applications to start emitting the processing. So we were able to do two things, not just um, uh, the job metrics itself, like a job is running, it's at this stage, et cetera. We were also able to throw in some data quality metrics in there, like these many rows processed. And that became very useful because we were able to diagnose functional issues also with our data pipelines. Um, CloudWatch was always there for uh, general deep dive logging. And we had to kind of do a balancing of both. We had to create history servers so we could look at the UIs. And for executor level logs, we had to go into CloudWatch. And um, that's pretty much it. Uh, there is These are all the elements we use to build up our alerting. And in the interest of time, I'll rush through and give you like the conclusion. This is how the quick site analytics results look like. The visuals are from uh, 
profitability um, project that we did. And here is just a gist. It's also available again in references. This is how the code looks like. What Glue essentially does is creates a wrapper for you on top of the Spark data frame. And you have an option to keep working with the Glue data frame, which is called uh, dynamic frame, actually. You can keep working with it, or you can peel it and go to the Spark data frame level and start using Spark data frame itself. That's pretty much what we have done, actually, just to keep it seamless between our existing code and uh, new code. And um, you have an option to write into multiple syncs because you're already in AWS. It's easy to connect across. That's that. And uh, next steps. What we are uh, still exploring, because as all these are moving parts, the technology keeps improving. And Blue 3.0 has been recently announced, which claims to have an, an implementation option to use AWS Event Bridge to have interdependent workflows. And we are keeping a close watch. We tried the managed workflow airflow that came recently, and it did not work well for us. So we are going to watch for this to resolve our still open question of interdependent workflows. And we are also keeping track of new custom connectors, which is not up to the mark yet. They claim that they do have uh, custom connectors, but it only works with off the bat uh, standard data objects on all the SaaS applications. The moment you want to go in uh, more custom setup in each of these SaaS applications, the connectors could not work. That's it. I and this is the references I was referring to. The second one is the API uh, data source API that we experimented, and this is our defensive publication. These are all the uh, references we use to come up with the pricing. And yes, did I make it, Ellie? Am I on time for questions? Yes. So we have about. Uh, six minutes left, awesome. um, and uh, I want to say thank you. That was uh, very interesting that you did all of the research for all of the different levels of, of need that you might have for different quantities of data. That's, that's very useful for me to, to learn from, uh, so thank, thank you. you. Um, what what um, do you think with all the new advancements in glue uh, that you're going to have to do a, another implementation of all these things so that you can see if you can benefit more from the uh, the future iterations of glue or are you going to stay with your option three that you that you like we um, we are going to stay with option three because even the improvisations that are happening are going to make it solidified further so they're going to strengthen it further. For example, the gaps that we see today are in terms of monitoring. And uh, we have been early adopters of uh, Blue ETL service. And we hope that we have screened enough that we will get that uh, built in. That's going to be a benefit. It's going to help us. The other improvisations that we are talking in terms of event-driven setup, it's again going to elevate our problems. So it's going to further strengthen the approach that we have taken. So there is a very less chance that we might deviate from the option that we have chosen so far. Uh, by the way, they're also trying to work on having a lot more hot clusters created. A Glue ETL essentially still runs on an EMR, but it's not the EMR we spin. It's an EMR that uh, AWS creates for us. So they are also working on keeping a hot um, set of EMR clusters where the job startup times are expected to go low. So they are, in fact, um, it's in line. I'm glad that the product that we chose has a very strong roadmap and uh, the improvisations that will come in will actually benefit us. Uh, remember to our, 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 our uh, participants, uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A whenever. Uh, we'd be happy to pass them on to the speaker. And if you think of questions later on, you can definitely reach me on LinkedIn. I'm more accessible there. And um, please do mention DataCon LA so I do not ignore the message. That's what I had. And if we do not have more questions, then I would like to really thank, thank DataCon LA and organizers. You've been such a great support, great team to work with. And um, I've been enjoying the sessions since today's I'm looking forward to more sessions. Thank you. Should we wait? We have again. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait for. I'll wait for two minutes and then uh, I'll close out the.
the session if, if we don't have any questions. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sunita. Yeah, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad it helps. This is kind of uh, the research of uh, six to eight months that we had to do. It's like necessary. Necessity is the mother of invention. So we had to solve this for ourselves. So I'm hoping we are able to elevate someone else's pain with this. Mm. Yeah, that's very good. I'll leave this slide on because I could spend more time talking and even providing more inputs into this. But yeah, I'll leave this on in case this triggers any questions. So you have you have integrations with Slack for uh, for when you get the the logging uh, for for the for the Spark stuff or for the um, for the the, the CloudWatch stuff. Or... Yeah, OK, let me explain. So this whole stack here, it's kind of mm. alerting and monitoring setup. So what typically happens is as we keep processing, I initially had arrows here, but it was too convoluted. So I thought it's better I speak to it. Um, we have these jobs as they run. They write into um, like application level instrumentation and data quality checks are written. This is part of the job. We built a library that does it that keeps writing into DynamoDB. And the other things are uh, something that you can configure. Do jobs as they run automatically create CloudWatch logs. That's how the system is designed. So you need to make sure you're watching the right logs to understand that your job failed. And that part comes with a combination of event bridge, cron job, and Lambda. So what you do is you keep watching for those. We also had the situation where we had data pushed from other uh, data sources to us. And what was happening at that time was if data did not come in, our job will run and say it's successful. There is no data. So we had to create another way of identifying if there is no data, then alert. And so for that, we had to write Lambda programs where uh, it looked for a specific day. And if it did not find the data, then trigger an alert, kind of yeah. exception handling. And how it would connect is all these, the event bridge, Lambda, everything would create an alert that gets pushed into SNS, which is our messaging layer. And SNS has subscriptions to Slack. We also have it into email. You can also do it into pagers. We did not do it into pager because for us, one business day is OK to respond. But you have an option to do that. So you could be woken up in the middle of night if it's necessary. Gotcha. Oh, I have to I have to have us close out. Sorry. Sorry to cut you short there. Thank you, Sunita, for your presentation and the attendees for interactions during the session. You can contact the speaker directly, like she said, on LinkedIn. If there are any further questions regarding this topic, please provide your feedback using the form that was provided in the chat box. Thank you again, everyone, for joining today's presentation. And I hope you have gained some insights from the session. Have a wonderful day. And thank you for being a part of this year's DataCon LA. Thank you again, Sunita. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs>